All right, happy Easter, Traders Point family. How we doing today? Good to be with you guys. I hope, uh, you know, this is the last of a kajillion services, so I hope you guys have shown up. I've been preaching for the last 18 hours, and I'm gonna empty the tank this hour, all right? So, um, Good to be with you guys. What you need to know uh, is that you have just walked into a celebration, not with, uh, I don't know, roughly 20,000 of us across all of our locations, but over 2 billion Christians around the globe, all declaring the same thing. Jesus is alive. The tomb is empty. Because he walked out of a grave, you can walk away from anything that you may be facing as well. So that means that chains can be broken, addictions can be uh, set free, relationships can be restored, anxiety can be lifted, anger can be cooled, hope can be found, all in the power of Jesus' risen name. Man, come on, somebody, celebrate that, man. You're gonna, if uh, you're sick of hearing applause, I'm really sorry, because, uh, you know, the, the next hour, like, I, I've got a lot of good news that I want to share with you. But before I do that, I know that you've already been greeted by your campus pastor, all of your locations, but I, I want to do that. So I just want to welcome everybody that may be a guest with us today. Man, we're so incredibly honored that you would be here. And in fact, I'd really rather not call you guests. I'd rather call you future family. Because that's how we want to view you. Because here's how this works, like at our house. Like we'll have guests over at our house. And you know, we'll invite you in. And we'll entertain you. And we'll feed you. And then at a certain hour, we'll show you the door. Because it's time to go, man. Like, and, but that's not our mindset around here. Like we, we want to see you back. We want to eventually call you family. In fact, I want to invite you back next weekend. We're kicking off a new five-week series of messages on a subject that touches all of us, either directly or indirectly, uh, called Weeds in My Garden. And we're gonna be talking about the subject of mental health, but we hear a lot about that subject nowadays, but we wanna look at what God's word has to say about it. And so uh, I just wanna encourage you to come back. Maybe you're uh, not normally uh, you know, a, a church attender, but maybe you'd say, you know what, for the next five weeks, I'll come, I'll watch, I'll tune in. And uh, if you do that, um, God will show up. I believe he's got a, a word specifically for you in that. Now uh, it's Easter. And we don't have many traditions around here, but we do have one, and that's an Easter survey. And so right now, if you would, across all of our locations and those of you online, pull out your phone and take a picture of this QR code behind me. Even if it's your first time to be with us today, I still want to hear from you. And there's a reason why we do a survey every Easter. It's real practical. Number one, this is the one weekend out of the year. You all decide to show up at the same time. And so I'm going to take advantage of that and get some good information from you. The second is the information off this really simple survey. In fact, it's just three questions. Won't take you long to fill it out at all. But your, the information you give us on this helps us set direction for the next year. You're, you're helping us to kind of lead and shepherd and pastor this church. So real quickly, we can do it right now. 30 seconds just to answer these three questions. Number one, how would you describe your relationship with Jesus? The more honest you are, the better. Totally okay for you to be honest about that. Number two, what area in your life presents the greatest challenges right now? This helps us with pastoral care and this helps set the course of the teaching series for the upcoming year. Number three, what would help you take your next step in knowing and following Jesus. And so thank you for taking just a few seconds to be, fill that out. If you need more time, that link will be live uh, for the next week or so. And we'd love to hear from you. Now, if you got a Bible, go ahead and uh, meet me in John chapter 20. John 20 is the passage that we are going to be walking through together today. Um, in chapter 19, Jesus is sentenced to death. He's crucified. He dies. And then he's buried in a borrowed tomb by a couple of men, Joseph of Arimathea, and a guy named Nicodemus. They go to Pilate, they ask for permission for Jesus' body, and then they, they bury him in Joseph's tomb. Now here's why that is significant. Most people that were crucified on a Roman cross did not get a proper burial. The body was just taken off of the cross eventually and just thrown into the garbage heap to decay or to be eaten by birds. But Jesus' body is buried in a borrowed tomb, fulfilling the prophet Isaiah's prophecy about it, that Jesus would die a criminal's death, but that he would be buried like a rich man. And Joseph of Arimathea was a rich man. And so he goes to Pilate, he asks for Jesus' body. He and Nicodemus, they're in a rush because it's beginning to be the Sabbath. So they, they get Jesus' body in there kind of hastily, and then they, 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 they leave it. Three days later, the first to visit the tomb are women. Now, why is that? Well, the ladies in the room know why. 
Like I, uh, if, I, if my wife's been out of town for a few days and I go to I pick her up at the airport and she's coming home, she's wondering if she's coming home to a clean house. I'm like, hey, babe, don't worry about it. I cleaned it up. She's like, mm-hmm. <laughs> now I got to clean up the clean up. Ladies, can I hear you? Like, you? You know what I'm talking about. So, so the reason why the ladies were the first to the tomb is because they got to clean up the clean up. They're like, you know what? We know that Jesus needs a proper burial. So Mary Magdalene shows up and the stone has been rolled away. The tomb is empty. Jesus meets her there. And then she goes to the disciples. Now we're picking it up in verse 18 of chapter 20. Mary Magdalene found the disciples and she told them, I have what the Lord? Seen the Lord. That's encounter talk. In fact, I want you to pay attention to how many times the word see and saw are mentioned in this passage. Because those are encounter talk words. Mary didn't say, I heard about it. There's a conspiracy theory. I read about it online. She's like, no, I saw him. She says this to the disciples. She gives them this message. Now, what do you think their response might be to this message of resurrection power? You might think that the disciples would high five each other, that they would throw a party, that they would hold a press conference. You know, hope can be found. Fear is gone. A new beginning is at hand. Nope. Look at where they are in verse 19. That Sunday evening, this is the first Easter, by the way. That Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Why were they meeting behind locked doors? Well, because they were afraid. Afraid of what? Well, they were afraid that if they could do that to Jesus, then the disciples were very likely next. That if they could crucify Jesus and put him to death, then it's just a matter of time before they're coming after them as well. But Mary shows up and she says, guys, I've seen the Lord. And that did not phase them. The message of resurrection power was missed upon them. They were deaf. They couldn't hear it. Why? Because of their fear. Now, here's the question that I just want to present in front of you today. Is there, is there anything, it's totally okay to be honest about this. Is there anything right now that is deafening the message of resurrection power in your life? And, and, and it may be the very same thing as what the disciples were facing. It's just good old fashioned fear. And there is a lot to be fearful of in the world right now. Is it just me or can the rest of you feel this? It feels as if the entire collective world is holding its breath, waiting for the next bad thing to happen. And you look at the news and you look at social media and you see all this fear that is going on and fear can keep you and me, it certainly kept the disciples from hearing and receiving the message of resurrection power. It, it could just be good things that distract us from the message of resurrection power. Man, don't get me wrong, I love Easter. It's one of my favorite holidays, but we can so easily get caught up in the event of Easter that we miss the message of Easter. And here's what I mean. I'm looking around the room right now. Y'all look good, man. Like you look good, man. Like you're, you're dressed in your Easter vest. Like there's all kinds of past, you like, look at a bunch of ice cream cones right now. Like it just looks amazing. And right now, like you've got your list, like you've got family in town and you're going to take a picture in front of the, like the green thing that says Easter and you already got your post, you know what you're going to say about it, you know. And already, like you've picked your path out of here to navigate the Trader's Point parking lot hunger games afterwards. So that way you can get to lunch on time. It's just like all the events of Easter, you're going to have the Easter egg hunt later. Like it's amazing and it's great. And I hope you enjoy all of it. Man, don't miss Jesus. And don't miss the message of resurrection power in the event of the Easter holiday. So here you got the disciples. They're behind locked doors. Mary told them she's seen the Lord. They're not buying it. Look at verse 19. Suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them. I love that so much. It's just like, I don't know, just get the picture in your mind. The disciples, like they're on the couch eating wings, watching the NCAA Final Four. And all of a sudden, you know, James kind of turns. He's like, hey, Jesus, could you pass the sweet baby? JC? <laughs> when did you show up? Right? Jesus just like Harry Potter's right into the room. He's just like suddenly. Now, now here's the thing. Jesus spent three years with these guys. These are some of his closest friends. And, and he told them what was going to happen. And they, they were kind of slow to the take. And then it happened. Now, now, I was thinking about this last week. I thought, if I'm Jesus and I resurrected from the dead and I'm showing up to my closest friends, what do you think the first words out of my mouth are going to be? And I thought about that for a minute. 
And I was like, now definitely I'm doing the Harry Potter thing. I'm definitely just like whoo, coming into the room. But then the first word out of my mouth, I think would be, ta-da. <laughs> you know, or I'm back, you know, or something like that. But here's Jesus', Jesus first words. Look, look at verse 19. Peace. Peace be with you, he said. And as he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and in his side. Why would he do that? Why would he show them his wounds? Because they saw him die. They saw him crucified to a tree. And he knows that they're going to need this evidence to believe. And it says that they were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. And again, he said, peace be with you. By the time we're finished with this passage, Jesus will have said that three times. I think there's a reason. And he says, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. That's mission talk. And then he breathed on them and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. So here's what I want you to see. At the presence of Jesus, their fear turns to joy. Their joy and belief was activated when they saw him. And now he is sending them as the Father has sent him. And he's giving them the Holy Spirit. The same Holy Spirit, by the way, that he's giving you and me. The same Holy Spirit that's in this room right now. The same Holy Spirit that will give you an encounter with the living God. Now, verse 24, and I like this hour. You guys are responsive. Last hour, they were quiet, man. I like this hour. So verse 24, it indicates a breakage of time. Now, now look at verse 24. It says, one of the 12 disciples, Thomas, was not with the others when Jesus came. That's such a bummer for him. Like the most significant event in human history. And where's Thomas? Oh, he went to Meyer to get more potato chips. And by the time he comes back, Jesus has already caught his Uber. Like he's gone. Now the disciples run up to him with the same message of resurrection power that Mary had given them. And they go to Thomas and Thomas walks in with you know, the bags of potato chips. And like, bro, you're not going to believe this. We saw Jesus. Not we heard about it, we read about it, we think this is true. We saw him, we talked to him, we touched him. You're, you're not going to believe it, man. And Thomas is standing there and he's like, you're right, I don't. And he replied, I won't believe it. Unless what? I see the nail wounds in his hands and I put my fingers into them and I place my hand into the wound in his side. Man, I love the fact, this is one of my favorite Easter passages. Because I don't know about you, but I can relate to Thomas so much. I, I think I would have been a lot like him. I think I would have been like, man, you know what, guys? Like, I, like, I believe you and all, but like, I need to see it to believe it. Like, I, I need, to, I need to, to seal the deal by actually touching the, the wounds in Jesus' hands and in his sides. Now, now here's what I want to point out, is that right after Thomas says this, uh, the very next verse, we'll get to it in a minute. In verse 26, it says eight days later. What I want you to see is that there seems to be no, res no immediate resolution to this conversation. A week goes by. Think about that for a minute. A week more of fear. A week more of behind locked doors. A week more of I wonder what's going to happen. A week more where the disciples are like, man, he didn't believe. I mean, we saw him, but I don't know how we're going to prove this to him. And this tells me that God is not insecure. Because an insecure God, would, uh, Jesus, like he knows that whole conversation just went down because actually we're going to see that Jesus replays the whole thing in a minute. Jesus heard Thomas say that. And an insecure God would have been like, oh, just, uh, you know. All right. but, it, but, but a secure sovereign God is like, okay, I'll let you sit in that for a minute. First Peter tells us that God is not slow in keeping his promises, that he's patient. And God, right now, some of you are like, man, God is kind of slow. God, where are you at? Kind of show up. Like I've, I've asked you to make yourself real to me. God doesn't seem to be doing anything. Well, well, he's on his timetable, not yours. And God is not slow. He's patient. And he's, he's patiently pursuing you. And he is sovereign. And he knows, he knows the exact day and hour when you're going to be in relationship with him. And it very well could be sooner than you think. See, every Easter... I mean, I, I, I respect Thomas so much. I honestly, I do. He's like my favorite uh, uh, person in this whole narrative because there is a skeptic in me and there's likely a skeptic in you. What I found is that some of the most faithful spiritual giants, not only of our day and age, but throughout church history, were natural skeptics. 
And it seems like every Easter, what I'm trying to do in the message are really two primary things. Number one, I'm trying to convince about half of you that you're not crazy for believing in a literal bodily resurrection. The second thing I'm trying to do is I'm trying to convince the other half of you that you're crazy for not believing in a literal bodily resurrection. And then the third thing I'm trying to do is I'm trying to reassure all of you that it's okay to have some doubts. Thomas did, and it's okay. Jesus doesn't pounce on him. He doesn't chastise him. He doesn't shame him for it. Listen, man, if you're tired of life, you're ready for Jesus. If you're fearful of life, you're ready for Jesus. If you've got some doubts because there's a skeptic in you, because you've been hurt and you've been misled in your past, you are more ready for Jesus than what you might imagine. So have you ever just wondered on Easter, like why was the stone rolled away? I remember growing up in church, going to Sunday school, hearing the Easter messages, and either what I thought I heard them say or they said, I don't remember which one is which, that the stone was rolled away so that Jesus could get out. But already in the passage, we've seen that Jesus can just sort of like appear into a room. He didn't seem to be held back by any sort of wall or barrier. So the stone didn't need to be rolled away so that he could get out, but so that we could see in. And if there's anybody right now who thinks, man, I just can't come to Jesus because I've got some really legitimate questions and doubts. I don't want to be fooled. And there's a lot of religions out there. There's a lot of paths you could take. I don't want to waste my life. I don't want to be fooled. And man, I can totally resonate with all of that. And so what, what you're doing is you're, you're just kind of holding back. You're kind of sitting back a little bit. And you're like, if I could have some answers to some questions then I would cross the line of faith. And I just simply want to say to you, you are waiting for something that can never happen. It doesn't matter what religion you end up subscribing to. It doesn't matter if you're an agnostic or an atheist. Every single path requires faith because there is nobody that has 100% of their questions answered. But what happens is, is that you, by faith, you step into something, you enter into something. And as you do so, your questions get answered gradually rather than all at once. It's not that the questions are bad and it's not that there aren't good answers to the questions. It's that we're, we're sitting back waiting for God to give us an answer key or email us the answers to our questions. When God is like, the only way to do this is through encounter. The only way to do this is through relationship. One of my favorite definitions of faith is this, when the unexplainable meets the undeniable. Like you can't explain it, but you can't deny it. Like you had, you had a, a, an encounter with the living God. And Jesus doesn't ignore or diminish Thomas's doubts. What he does is he addresses them with an undeniable encounter. Check it out. Verse 26, eight days later, the disciples are gonna run it back. They're together again. I guess the tournament's not over. Some, some of you got that. All right, so, and this time, this time Thomas was with him. Right, Thomas, no, I, I'm not going anywhere. We will door dash the potato chips. I'm staying right here, all right? So, so the doors were locked, but suddenly, as before, I think Jesus loved doing this. It's just like, he's standing there among them. Hey guys, what's going on? Peace be with you. And then he turns to Thomas. Now, the way that you read the Bible, tone is everything. And I don't think Jesus turned to Thomas with his arms crossed. I don't think he's wagging a finger. I don't think that he's shaming him. I think Jesus turned to Thomas with a smile on his face and moisture in his eyes. And he looks at Thomas and he's like, Thomas, hey man, put your finger here and look at my hands and put your hand into the wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. Man, I think Thomas gets a bad rap, man. For those of you that have been in church, you know, for a while, or you know the Bible stories, you, you likely know that Thomas has a nickname. What, what is it? Doubt, of course, Doubting Thomas. You know what I think? I think Thomas is in heaven going, come on, guys, really? One time I had questions. I get branded with the nickname for life. <laughs> Doubting Thomas. But here's what we need to know about Thomas is that this oftentimes gets overlooked. Did you know he was one of the bravest disciples? He was the guy that said, guys, let's go to Jerusalem and die with Jesus. He was a passionate father. He was all in or all out. Like he's like, I'm ready to go, right? He is not a doubting Thomas. He's just simply a realist. He had legitimate questions. Why? Because he saw Jesus die. 
And typically, dead people don't come back to life. So Jesus showed him undeniable proof. And check out Thomas's response, verse 28. My Lord and my God, Thomas exclaimed. I love that. Thomas didn't go, hmm, that's really interesting. Thomas didn't do what many of you do. Like whenever, I know that I'm preaching sometimes, whenever some of you all of a sudden, like it's, it sounds like the holy herd. Mm. I'm like, wow, these people are getting fired up, man. It's like, you know, Thomas didn't do that. Like Thomas is like, hey, did you give me something to ponder? Jesus and I shall go away and prolificate on it. He didn't do any of that. Immediately, he's just like, my Lord and my God. There was an audible response. There was a tangible reaction. He didn't just kind of stand there stoic. He was passionate about it. And then what I really love about this passage is that as Jesus is talking to Thomas, he has you and me in mind. Easter 2024, because he mentions you and me in this passage. Did you know that? We're in here. Right in verse 29. Then Jesus told him, you believe because you have seen me. Now here we are. Blessed, that means Jesus is saying there is a blessing for those. Those is a reference to you and me who believe without seeing me. I love that. He, Jesus basically said, he is acknowledging the challenge of belief. If you're like, man, I'm just really struggling to believe this whole thing. Jesus is like, man, I, I feel you. I understand. And I'm telling you, there is a blessing for those of you who choose to put your trust full devotion in me, just like Thomas and the disciples, when they had something you don't have is that they got to touch my wounds and they get to put their hand in my side and you don't. But you know what? By choosing to put your trust in me and believe in me, there is a blessing for you. Now listen, this isn't blind faith, dumb faith, cross my fingers, pie in the sky. I hope it's true. Sometimes society says, well, that's what faith is. Listen, man, there's good reason to believe that this happened. Christianity is not based on a story, a feeling, or a philosophy or set of beliefs. Christianity rises and falls on an event, the resurrection of Jesus. Like it either happened or it didn't. And if it happened, then that means this changes everything. And the resurrection of Jesus was witnessed by over 500 people. Here's what I want you to see here is that the disciples in this passage are afraid of the Jews. They're afraid of being put to death. They're behind locked doors. But you fast forward through the rest of their lives, every single one of them courageously died proclaiming Jesus had walked out of a grave. Peter was crucified upside down for it. Matthew was burned at the stake for it. James was run through with a sword for it. And the reason why I point that out is that people don't die for something that they know is a lie. And some of you are like, objection. People die for stuff that's not true all the time. That's why I have to take my shoes off at the airport. That's not what I said. People will die for something that's not true if they think it's true. No one will die for something that they know is undeniably false. So here's what I mean by that, is that Matthew and the other disciples, if they made it up, then you got to ask yourself, why would they make it up? And others will say, well, they just made it up to get power for themselves. And I'm like, what kind of power did they get? They all died proclaiming that Jesus had resurrected. So here's what this means. Don't you think that one of them would have cracked over the next 40 years? Like, like Matthew's being burned at the stake and they start to light up his feet and the flames are coming up his legs. And he's sitting there saying to himself, you know what, this, I think I'm just taking this a little bit too far. <laughs> like, I know that this is a lie. I know that this is a legend. So I'm gonna cry uncle and I'm just gonna go ahead and come clean with this because I know that this is a legend. There's no way that Matthew's like, well, I know this is a lie, but uh, you know, I, I'm not gonna quit because quitters never prosper. And I was like, like, come on, man. <laughs> like they all were put to death because they literally saw Jesus alive. One of them was Jesus' own brother. Think about the miracle of that for a minute. How many of you have a brother? <laughs> what would it take if your brother today at Easter lunch said, hey, I have some news for you. I am the son of God. <laughs> like, man, get out of here, man. You're the one that gave me swirlies as a kid, right? It's like, there's no way I'm singing worship songs to you. But James, the brother of Jesus, is like, Jesus is the risen son of God. Listen, man, Jesus' resurrection means 
that he conquered death itself. He put death to death. So when Jesus says in John 14, 6, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life, nobody comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is not saying, I am the superior way among all other ways, although we could argue that he is, but that's not what he's saying. He's not saying, I've got a better philosophy of life, or if you, I've got a better set of morals, and if you just follow my way, then life's going to work out better for you. We could argue that it is, but that's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, I'm the only one who paid the debt that you owed in full. I'm the only one who put death to death. That's why I'm the way. That's why I'm the truth. That's why I'm the only way to God. And you read John 14, 6. And you might say, well, Jesus, you're not being very politically correct. He's not, but he is being biblically correct. And here's what I mean. And, and, and I want to say this gently, but I do want to say it directly. That if you've ever heard or you've been told or you believe that, you know what, it doesn't really matter what I believe, just as long as I sincerely believe it. And I don't hurt anybody. And, uh, you know, uh, all religions kind of eventually lead to the same place anyway. And so let me just kind of take a little bit of truth from this philosophy of life and a little bit of truth from that religion and just kind of mix it all up in a spirituality cocktail and just kind of, I'm just going to do me and I'm just going to follow my heart. That sounds good. That sounds true. I'm telling you, that is a lie straight from the lips of Satan himself. And I'm telling you, it sounds good, but most effective lies are. See, Satan knows that well over 90% of the human population, not only today, but throughout history, believes in some sort of God. They believe. And so Satan knows, like the odds of getting you to just not believe anything are pretty slim. So what he'd like to do is just water it down. And just say, hey, man, you don't need to reject it. Just, just take a little bit of it and mix it with all the other stuff that you want to do. And then you end up, and then it ended up neutralizing everything. So, so Jesus said, I'm the way and the truth and the life. The difference between Christianity and every other religion, worldview, and philosophy in the world is that the founders of every other faith are buried and in the ground. And so uh, let me just give you a couple of examples. This is the Temple of the Tooth in Sri Lanka. Every year, tens of thousands of Buddhists travel to this spot where one of the teeth of Buddha is buried underneath that temple. They pray and meditate and remember the things that their dead, buried founder left them. This is the tomb of Confucius in China. Every year, tens of thousands of people who practice Confucianism travel to this burial place of their religion's founder to remember what they taught. This is the mosque of the prophet in Medina. Every year, millions of Muslims travel to the final resting place of the founder of their religion. I have visited several non-religious uh, famous people's graves. You likely have too. I've been to George Washington's grave. There's, there's the, you know, the caskets. It's on the other side of the bar. I've been to John F. Kennedy's gravesite with the eternal flame. I, in the mid-90s, I was in Russia and I actually got, I went to Red Square and I got to visit Stalin's tombs. Kind of creepy because you get to walk through there and his body is there under glass, under lights. Very creepy. But he's still there. Uh, last year I went to Israel and I visited the two locations where they think Jesus may have been buried. They're not entirely sure. It's one of these two. It's either the garden tomb or the church of the Holy Sepulcher. We went to both. Both were empty. Both you could walk inside. Both there was no body. Both there was lines uh, trying to get in. This is the only tomb in the world that's famous for what's not in it. And some of you say, no, Aaron, wait a second. Like, are you saying that all other religions are wrong? No, that's not what I'm saying. Jesus is saying that. Jesus says, I'm the way and I'm the truth and I'm the life. And when, when they're all in the ground and he's not, I'm going with him. Now, for those of you that didn't clap just now, let me just say that the Bible is intellectually honest about resurrection talk. Now, now, here's what I mean. That if it was a legend, if it was a lie, if it was made up, then after this, there's no way the authors of Scripture are bringing up the subject of resurrection because they don't want people prodding at it too much. Because if it's a legend and if it's a lie, it's going to fall apart. But Paul goes right at it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he addresses it on the head. Check out what he says. He says, For if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, then all our preaching is useless and your faith is useless. And we apostles would all be lying about God. For we have said that God raised Christ from the grave. And then in verse 19, he says, if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. What's Paul saying? Paul is saying that Christianity is based on an event, the resurrection. And it either happened or it didn't. And if it didn't happen, let me just kind of drive this home a little bit closer, right? 
If the resurrection of Jesus did not happen, here's what this means for you. This means that you no longer need to be one foot in and one foot out. You can just be both feet out. What this means, if the resurrection didn't happen, this is the last Easter you ever have to get dressed up and attend church and not feel bad about it. And some of you just got like really nervous right now because you're like, Aaron, this is the first week I've got my spouse to attend with me. And that's the best you got. I got my coworkers here. My boss came. My neighbors come. <laughs> Aaron, do your job. All right, I am. I am. Because listen, listen, the opposite is true as well. If Jesus did walk out of a grave, then that means it needs to be both feet in. If Jesus did walk out of a grave, then that means not only should you be here every Christmas and Easter, you should be here as often as possible, not because God judges your church attendance, but because you're passionately pursuing Jesus Christ as Thomas did. That you're like, you know what? He deserves everything. This radically changes everything. If Jesus walked out of a grave, then that means I can change too. Come on, man, think about it. There is no doubt that Jesus changed the world. I I always know that people are grasping at straws when they finally kind of get around. They're like, well, I don't even know that Jesus ever existed at all. And I'm like, come on, man. There are so many non-religious historical figures that record the life of Jesus. We know that he existed. And he existed long before television and cameras and video cameras and all that kind of stuff. And and in the words of C.S. Lewis, the claims that Jesus made. Jesus didn't say that he was a nice little moral teacher like a Mr. Rogers kind of of the heaven. He said he was Lord. So C.S. Lewis said, there's, you know, he's only one of three things. He is a liar, a lunatic, or he's Lord. And if he's a liar and he's a lunatic, then that means you need to disregard everything he ever taught. Even all the stuff that kind of seems to make sense to you, all the moral stories. Just throw it all out the window because he's a lunatic or he's a liar. But if he's Lord, and he is, then that requires full devotion. There is no doubt that Jesus changed the world. He still makes the cover of Newsweek every year. (laughs) One out of three people in the world are devoted to him. 2,000 years have gone by and we're still talking about him. But that's not really what I'm concerned about. No doubt Jesus changed the world. Jesus' life split the calendar into two, B.C. and A.D. Here's a question that I want to ask. Can he change you? That's really the kind of question that he's asking. Now, some of you are like, okay, well, what does he need to change about me? Because, you know, and I feel like I'm doing pretty good. You know, it's like, I I know I'm not, you know, uh, in church a lot. And, you know, I I haven't talked to God in a while, but I'm not living a bad life. And I've got a pretty good marriage and my kids are, you know, on the rails and, and, you know, we're making enough money. And and, and, and here's the deal. You're like, what do I need new life for? Let me give you two truths. The first one, I know 100% of you are going to totally agree with me. The second Not so much. All right, so so here's the first one. All right, so here's the first truth. We live in a world that is certifiably jacked up in every possible way. Don't you agree with that? Yeah, Yeah, I think you would probably agree with that. Like if there's any of you that are like, I don't know, Aaron, I think things are pretty well buttoned up. Like what world are you living in, man? Like you're crazy. I just turn on the news, look at social media. Like it's a dumpster fire. And there's all kinds of problems economically, Uh, you know, politically, relationally, like you name it, man. There are so many problems. And you look at all the problems, you're like, how in the world are we ever going to even begin to address and fix this thing? Well, we won't on this side of eternity. Jesus said he would come to put to right what's been wrong. Right, so there is a big problem in the world. We all agree with that. Now, now here's the second truth that you're probably not going to like so much, but it's still true. You and I are to blame. It's easy to look and say, well, Those people over there are to blame. Those people across the political aisle. Those people in another country. Those people of another race or ethnicity. Those people are to blame. No, 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 man. Look at your own heart. That we, see, see, you and I are highly incentivized to view ourselves as victims in our culture. And we don't really like to talk about sin or sinning or being sinners anymore. You know, we know we're not perfect. We would rather call ourselves mistakers rather than sinners. We're like, you know, nobody's perfect. And if I do mess up, it's probably somebody else's fault. You know, I ate processed food as a kid. <laughs> that is the first service that has come out of my mouth. All right, so, so I told you I was going to empty the tank, man. So, so Jesus, listen, Jesus said this. Jesus said that he must be crucified. He didn't say, you know, I need to be or I probably should or it'd be a good idea. He goes, I must be crucified. Crucified. Those are heavy words. He's saying this is the only option. What he is saying is that you and I are not a victim who's been sinned against. 
We are villains who have done this sinning. You may say, Aaron, that's offensive. Well, yeah, it would be if I was saying it at you, but I'm not saying it at you. I'm saying it with you. Man, we're all in the same boat. And I'm telling you, man, like there is nobody that is in more need of God's grace than the person that you're looking at on the platform right now. That I've got a heart problem, man. I've got a sin problem from the inside out. And the problem is not out there in the world, it's in here. And you need a heart transplant And that is not something that you can do yourself. You have a sin problem in your heart. We are sinners in need of a savior, savior, not mistakers in need of a life coach. And so, so here's the reality of the gospel. Here's the reality of the gospel. Listen, man, God is so holy that a payment for sin, it had to be made. It had to be made. But God is so loving that he made that payment himself. You know, on Good Friday, when Jesus has been beaten and scourged and mocked and spit upon, and he puts the beam on his shoulders and he's walking down the Via Della Rosa to Golgotha, and he's so weak that he falters and he falls down. Many of you may know the story that a guy named Simon uh, is, 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 kind of comes over and he bends down. And we say that Simon carried Jesus' cross to Golgotha, but that's technically not true because Jesus was already carrying Simon's cross. And when Jesus was beaten and when he was mocked and when he was punched and when he was nailed to the tree, listen, man, Jesus was not just being crucified for you. He was being crucified instead of you. And a sin against an eternal and perfect God either requires an eternal and perfect payment or the payment of an eternal and perfect sacrifice. And so the crucifixion erased your sinful past and the resurrection provides you with a hopeful future. The Bible puts it like this. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So I want you to picture it this way. You're sitting down at a table across from God and you're beginning to make some negotiations about your eternal destiny. And God says, listen, I'll make you a deal. This is the debt that you owe. And it is so much you couldn't even begin to repay it in a thousand lifetimes. But God says, I've got a deal for you. If you would just push across the table all of your sin and all of your shame and all of your secrets, don't make any excuses for it. Just slide it across the table through confession and repentance. I'll take it. And then in exchange, I'll slide across the table my son's holiness and righteousness and sinlessness. And I'll apply that to your account. Guys, can I just ask you this? Why would you ever pass up that deal? Because that's what the gospel is. The gospel isn't, well, I'll try really hard and I'll try to learn better and I'll try to be a good moral person. That's not what it is. It's you taking the righteousness of Jesus because he nailed your sin to a tree. And the Bible says that that same power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead can be at work in you right now. So I didn't finish the passage in 1 Corinthians 15. Paul kind of sets this up. He's like, hey man, like if Jesus didn't walk out of a grave, we're to be more pitied. Like all Christianity, it just completely collapses. And then he says this in verse 20. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. And he is the first of a great harvest of all who died. And that sentence is a little peculiar. The, the, the first of a great harvest? Like what in the world does that mean? What he's talking about here is like if you're a farmer and you plant uh, a, a crops in a field. And then at the first sign of harvest, the farmer knows there's more to come. So what he's saying here is that resurrection power didn't just happen to Jesus only, it happened to Jesus first. And that means that you and I don't just celebrate Easter, you can experience it today. That that same power can come into your life. Some of you may be sitting there thinking to yourself, man, Aaron, this sounds so good. And I honestly really like want it, I, like I, I want to believe this is true, but there's some things that are holding me back. If it's not the questions that I have, then it's just knowing who I am. I don't feel worthy. Like I know you said a minute ago that you could call me future family, but honestly, like if you knew who I really was, you wouldn't call me future family. You'd kick me right out of here. Like I'm not even talking about some distant thing in the past. Like I'm talking about like what I looked at on the internet last night. Like I'm talking about the divorce that I just recently had and it was nobody's fault but my own. I'm talking about the the darkness that's in my own soul, the things that I've done and said to betray the people that I love the most. Man, you know, Aaron, like last year I I was here on Easter and I had this big commitment that I was gonna come back and I was gonna turn over a new leaf and I was gonna make a commitment to Jesus. And this is the first time I've been back since then. 
And I just can't get it together. In fact, today, like we just wanted to have a nice Easter with our family and we got the kids all dressed up and we were coming over here, but the kids started cussing in the minivan on the way to church. And that's this is the kind of family we are. We're just a mess. And I'm looking around the room and everybody just looks like they have their act together. I don't think I would fit in here. Man, you would fit in here more than you might think. Because here's what I want to ask you to do. I want you to look around at those people that you think have it all together. Like, don't look directly at them. That'd be kind of weird. <laughs> just kind of like, just out of your peripheral. You're like, you know, you've already seen her today. You're like, man, yeah, she looks like she's got it all together. Right. Like, they're like, I want her life. Like, I want his life. Like, they just look. Listen, listen. They don't have it all together. They are not decent people who just figured it out and they are just living their nice little holy lives. We, we have, we are, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. We are all a mess. We don't bring anything to the table. We, we come totally dependent upon the sacrifice that Jesus made. Now li listen, man, Jesus has done everything necessary for you to be accepted. He has done everything necessary for you to be changed. He has done everything necessary for your past to be forgiven and for your future to be empowered. But, but listen to me, look right at me. You have to receive it. You gotta receive it. You gotta hold your hands out. You gotta, you gotta, here's what confession and repentance is. It's letting go of the stuff that you're holding on to so that you can receive what God wants to give you in and through Jesus. And so you gotta receive it by, by faith. By faith. And it's not a blind faith. It's a reasonable faith. And there is a phrase over and over again in the passage that says this. He appeared to them. He appeared to them. New information will not change anything. You need a divine encounter. You need God to appear to you. And so right now, would you just be willing to say, Jesus, here's where I'm at. I'm a mess. And I've got doubts and I've got questions and I've got some hurts that I haven't fully healed, but I need an encounter with you. Would you make yourself real to me? Would you show up? Now, now here's the thing, like it'd be awesome if after the service, as you're walking through the lobby, he's there to take a picture in front of the Easter thing with you. That'd be amazing. But I don't think we can pull that off. We can do one better. The Holy Spirit is in this room right now and he is with you and he is beckoning you and he's chasing you down. He wants to have an encounter with you and listen. today right now that there will be a day of reckoning at some point and only a fool goes through life unprepared for what is inevitable and right now you can you can put all of that doubt as to where you will not only spend your eternal future but even like what's going to happen tomorrow in the world that listen man like whatever happens and I'm pretty sure that there's more tragedies to come, unfortunately. I'm pretty sure there's more bad news to come, unfortunately. But God is still sovereign and he is king. And Jesus has already won the battle. He's walked out of a grave. And so that kind of resurrection power that can steady your feet in an unstable world is ready for you right now. Man, you gotta receive it. You gotta receive it. And so here's what I wanna ask you to do. We're gonna give you an opportunity, just like Thomas, to have an audible response to the message of the gospel. Listen, man, don't just go, hmm, interesting. I'll ponder that till next year. Man, you were kind, I, I don't want you to pull away from here today going, oh man, the worship was so amazing and the coffee was so good and the picture booth was incredible and that preacher was so funny. Like, no, no, like I want you to walk away going, who was that preacher? Who were those people? What was that church? I don't care. I met Jesus there. I had an encounter with the living God and I want you to experience that right now. So here's what I wanna ask you to do. Across all of our locations, your campus pastor is gonna give you instructions on how you can be baptized. But what I wanna do is I just wanna lead you in a prayer. And right now, if you just got the smallest wobbly faith, but you're ready to respond, then just let me lead you through this prayer. Dear God, I come to you right now, man, just like Thomas, like I've got some doubts and I'm afraid. And I'm, honestly, I'm angry and I'm anxious. But I come to you right now and I, I, through, a, through a weak faith, I, I declare that you are the risen son of God. I believe. And I want that kind of resurrection power in my life. So I'm gonna slide across the table all my secret sin and shame. And I trust that what God has said is true, that he will in return give me the holiness, the righteousness, the purity of, that Jesus died for me to have. And so I declare that there is a God and I am not him and that Jesus is the Son of God who made a full payment on my behalf. He declared it is finished on the cross. That is a word for a receipt that means paid in full. And so I receive it today. 
And so, God, would you enter into my life through the power of the Holy Spirit? Would you give me the strength to face this uncertain world with certainty? Would you give me a peace that passes all understanding? Because I trust you and I believe in you and I will follow you imperfectly, but I will follow you all the rest of my days with full devotion and passion. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer, man, we're just going to celebrate that with you right now. Man, way to go. Way to go, man. So what I wanna ask you to do right now is I wanna ask you to have an audible, tangible, physical response to that decision through baptism. The Bible teaches that baptism is the first step of obedience that you make. It is an external expression of an inward transformation. And it literally is you being buried, lowered into the watery grave so that you can be resurrected as a new creation. And you need to experience that today if you've never done it, or if you don't remember doing it, or if you previously did it for uh, poor reasons. So right now, what I'm gonna ask you to do, is just everybody stand to your feet. If you need to be baptized, if you're feeling that conviction of the spirit, you can walk right out of these double doors to my right, your left. If you're feeling fearful and you need somebody to go with you, just grab the hand of the person sitting next to you and ask them to go with you. If you don't know them, like I'm, I'm sure they'll probably go with you. It'll be okay, like it'll be fine. <laughs> And uh, let's celebrate right now as we watch these people come to life.